Hey everybody, this is Sam, your uh, pop archivist, a pre-show pop archivist, as it were, uh, with a little uh, announcement prior to the show, which is with Johnny Sims, obviously from Magnus Archives. Uh, Johnny had a heart out towards the end there, and I did not use my time as well as I thought I did, which is a, um, a lesson for future and present Sam, uh, as well as all you future and present archivists out there. So just to let you know, if it feels rushed at the end, it is rushed at the end because he had to go and I just kept, you know, talking. Uh, I also didn't get to do a lot of the links or uh, the usual, uh, you know, plugs and everything that you would uh, have at the end of a show like this. So I'm going to do them here right now. Uh, first of all, uh, please go to MacGuffin and Company and check out all of their games. Uh, the Pit Crawler Indiegogo, which at the time of this recording and the episode being posted, will still have been live for, I think, a little bit, I think a week or a little bit less. Um, the link will be there in the description until after the campaign's over, so if you don't see it there, it means the campaign's over, but you should still go to MacGuffin and Company, uh, their website, to check out all their games and books that are available. Uh, you should also listen to the Magnus Archives, uh, even if you've already listened to it. You should still go listen to it again and again and again. Uh, you'll always find something new there, uh, I should know. Uh, you should also uh, read Johnny's book, uh, 13 Stories, which is available wherever books are sold, I assume. Uh, it's it's very good. I like it. Uh, and uh, if you want to follow uh, Johnny on Twitter, he has a Twitter account that I will also link. I think it's Johnny Waistcoat uh, on, on Twitter, uh, as well as McGuffin and Company on Twitter. Uh, and you should follow me at darling underscore Sammy, S-A-M-M-Y. You should also go to poparchives.com, which is pop-archives.com. Uh, and you should like and subscribe to the channel, hopefully, if this is something that appeals to you. Uh, if there is a property that you think I should cover or talk about, uh, either write an article for the website or do here on the channel, uh, you can always uh, suggest so in the comments or you can email me at popculturearchives.com. Uh, the, the Gmail account is also on the website, so you can check out all that stuff there. And uh, I have a master list that I'm working from, so I'm always uh, working through it. Uh, you can also check the website just to see what I've already talked about. So just giving you an idea of what to suggest and what not to. So yeah, that's all for me. Just wanted to get that stuff out there because it I didn't have time at the end because I was bad at my job. No at my hobby job. Uh, so yeah, just letting you know, and uh, let's get into the show. Uh, we are back again uh, with Pop Archives, the the, the video. Um, and this is Sam, your Pop Archivist, back with uh, a very special guest, uh, the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Johnny Sims himself. Welcome, Johnny. <laughs> Hello, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. <laughs> Yay! Uh, yes, from your Castle of Screams, uh, which we've established, uh, where you write your horror, um, and uh, look upon those of us who uh, would cower in fear. I mean, fingers crossed. Yeah, like, I mean, that's I'm, the goal. I'm doing my job uh, all right. Yeah. And there's, there's some cowering. One day. I mean, it's, it's like goals is just Castle of Screams. <laughs> Trouble is, most people know my voice a lot more than my face, so, like, you know, when I go out, no one's cowering. Oh, well, you have got to fix that now, so we'll work on that here, starting here. Everyone look at this face, cower, general, blah, blah, blah. There we go. That message. Um, and also, if you see me looking off here, I wrote down some notes prior to our, uh, our little get-together, and then I hurt my hand because I haven't written down notes in a while, so that's fun. I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah like, i'll be honest like sometimes at the end of the day like doing a bunch of writing like you feel a little twinge and you're like uh oh yeah it's also a, a a wrist that i sprained when i worked retail so it will act up from time to time my dominant wrist so that's fun but no one's here to talk about my various injuries in retail um we're here to talk about the magnus archives primarily um, mostly because uh, if those of you watching watched the very first video I ever put out, uh, first of all, thank you. Second of all, I'm sorry. Um, it's a two-hour video of me going through um, several podcasts that uh, all deal with archives and archival issues to some degree, um, and they're all audio fiction, and uh, my goal 
with this channel is not only to talk about the depiction of archives and archivists in pop culture media, but also to kind of talk to those who have utilized the archives and archivists in their media as a means of just going like, why? Poor K. Um, so this is uh, very special for me because Johnny, I'm going to do the, the little gushy part here. So prepare yourself. Here's the compliment. Just preparing to receive praise. Yes. Okay. It was very good and you did a very good job. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, but it, it really was. You have 200 episodes of a series that um, for the majority of it takes place in an archives. And your main character, when not referred to by your name, is referred to as the archivist. Uh, so it's kind of important and a big deal in my circles to have that type of media to uh, kind of largely examine. So um, from, from the bottom of my archival soul and heart, thank you, first of all, for coming on the show. <laughs> Um, but we will get into the nitty gritty of it now. Um, uh, as we talked about before, I do not, I have never expected anyone to be an expert on archives and, and, uh, and uh, archival processes unless they were an actual archivist writing these yeah. things. I, I mentioned to you before, uh, just before we came on, um, I, was, I was talking to my partner Sasha about this. And I was, I was saying, oh yeah, like, you know, Sam's invited me to, to talk about archiving. And he was like, you don't know anything about archiving. Why is why do they want to talk to you? <laughs> I was like, well, I didn't write a show with it in the title. So oh, but, I mean, this that's is... probably the fact I don't know much about it is probably going to be the point. Yeah, it's I mean, it's negligible, but here we are. Um, <laughs> and really, that just kind of mirrors because uh, your partner, Sasha, played Georgie in the Magnus Archives mm -hmm. with uh, with her basically calling John out being like, but you don't have any experience as an archivist either. <laughs> so why yeah. are you even the head archivist? I don't get uh, it. Arts mirroring life and vice versa. Yes. Um, Would seem to be a lot of uh, Magnus, uh, especially in the first, in the first couple of seasons, because um, before I get into that, actually, I do want to ask, um, when you were developing the Magnus archives, um, was it always an archival setting? Because um, I know in interviews and Q and A's when you were talking with uh, with Alex Newell, your uh, you know co creator, co partner in uh, creating Magnus Archives, that uh, it was just kind of pitched as an anthology show at first, right? Yeah. So I feel like um, so that the, the the initial idea was like the statements were the core of the initial pitch mm -hmm. the i like i've been uh, listening to a lot of um horror podcasts myself i've been um reading a lot of creepypasta actually oh. in the years running up and that sort of like because that genre generally has a, like a first person a very like immediate this is a thing that has happened to me mm -hmm. uh feel to it the idea of uh, statements really uh really locked in uh also uh, a show that had just sort of started to really wind up at the time knife point horror uh was one that i really enjoyed and that that had every episode certainly in the early uh in the early ones always started with my name is mm. x um and then it would leap into a first person story and so that like that just framing of like my name is yeah like really dug into me and so I pitched initially this idea of like statements being read out by somebody who is uh, organizing these statements who is investigating them so that there is this framing device mm -hmm. um, and so there were I think I can't remember if we actually did discuss uh, all like possible titles but I think there's like a li there's like a list of maybe five or six the Magnus X's it theoretically could have been the Magnus oh, okay. library, the Magnus files. The Ma I mm -hmm. mean, like you know, you, you'll you'll have seen however many uh, other sort of serialized uh, yeah. horror um, horror things using similar formulations. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we ultimately we landed on archives uh, for two reasons: that like the obvious reason being that it it flowed best. Like mm. the Magnus archives 
to me had the most pleasing rhythm sure. but also thematically um because at this point we didn't have a strong idea of um exactly what um what the meta plot was going to be mm -hmm. but um the magnus like archives thematically felt the most resonant with where i sort of was starting to germinate this thought of, of the of the series going of, of the meta plot going um the idea of history that is implied in archives that isn't necessarily um implied in in sort of library or files or, or whatever mm -hmm. um this this idea of history of preserving history um of history having a physical presence in the modern world and sort of a kind of and, and also the so in a library you are and, and obviously all this is very much my interpretations and yeah. gut gut feelings about what i kind of felt like an archive was sure um circa sort of 2014 hmm. um so to me a library implied storage but also activity engagement with like your your sort of um you know you're taking books out you're referencing books all this sort of thing an archive uh felt like a more static's not quite the right word but it, it is to collect and preserve yeah like the, the the stuff in an archive is not necessarily doesn't feel like it is being taken out and referenced and checked it is it is there like it, it it feels like a place which is at a sort of at a remove mm -hmm. almost to the actual things that it is um it is archiving it feels that there's an aspect of there's an aspect almost of of consumption in in a certain way yeah. but like so yeah the themes of an archive as i understood it as i conceived it um resonated with where i felt like i wanted the show to go i didn't have i didn't have uh, the full sort of schematic of like the powers and um, mm -hmm. the 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 metaphysics of the world at that point but certainly the idea of uh watching and seeing things and like the story being the, the stories being a part of how the world worked yeah uh was absolutely something that was was in there right from the conception so i think all of that fed into archives being plus like the archivist feels like a feels like it feels like a like a a, a cool title in <laughs> a horror metaphysics sort of way mm -hmm. um and like you know the librarian also could have been but that that again that doesn't there's, there's, there's a, a different connotation yeah there's a there's a different visual that you have of a librarian oftentimes i mean and a lot of this does stem from like uh stereotypes that mm. we've oh, all accumulated archetypes we've kind of developed in the cultural zeitgeist you know to use other big words um and so I can understand that. Like uh, one of the things that I was kind of, you know, um, mulling around in my head when I was doing the video and then re wrote the article was like, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, which on average, like archives and libraries and, and uh, museums overlap in such, you know, similar ways, but then there's always like the outliers of the, the diagram where you're like, okay, well, this is where they're more different, but this is where they're more similar. Um, and a lot of it always boils down to the types of materials collected and then uh, curation um, and then also distribution. Cause like you say, with a library, this is a check them out, bring them back when you feel like it essentially. Yeah. I mean, like not all libraries are lending libraries, but, sure. but those that aren't tend to be reference libraries where you can still, you still order up the books. You're still sort of yeah. engaging with them. Like they are there to be used, which I mean, might be the case with an archive oh yeah uh, yeah archives yeah. uh 
depending again on the institution, you have a very active, you know, uh, reference uh, section or, you know, people are constantly, um, we have, uh, there's a position like a processing archivist who is constantly looking through collections and putting them together and creating a finding aid so people know what the you know, what the hell they're looking for. Um, so there, yeah, there is an active process within the archives, but the um, the materials are static in the sense that they don't leave the building, hopefully. Mm -hmm. If they do, then yeah, <laughs> exactly. There have been a lot of thefts uh, that I've heard about over the years. Um, so yeah, and, and it is really interesting. Like um, I have a friend who does, um, uh, translation for mangas. Um, uh, so he's fluent in Japanese and uh, I was doing an article for an anime series called The Secret Archive, The Mysterious Archives of Dantalian, something like that. So it implies archives, obviously, from the title. Couldn't be further from the truth in the actual, <laughs> the actual anime. Um, and even the Japanese translation of the title into English doesn't there is no word for archives there. So I was asking like, why, why archives? Like th this doesn't make sense. He's like, it probably just sounded cool. Like they just- Like, I mean, there is always an aspect of like, well, this is the one that sounds coolest. Yeah. We'll figure the rest out later, you know? Yeah. Um, and it was very much, uh, I, th I think it was about sort of halfway through the first season when I started, um, I started like having to sort of do a bunch more research into actually what does go into our archiving and uh, i was like oh okay Ooh. so what what i've what what i've depicted here is nothing really like actual archiving for the most part um and you get it you get it right spiritually to uh you know in, I, think, I think no go ahead I, sorry i was gonna say i think that's 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 the hope Mm -hmm. uh like the, the the hope that you generally have when you are writing uh a job especially i think mm -hmm. that is not your own or one that, not one that you have had um uh, in like you know recent like recent enough to be to be current like for instance yeah. I, I at one point for a year or two i worked at the sort of the photo processing lab uh mm -hmm. in in a, a a boots which is a big pharmacy in in the uk i did that when uh, i worked at Reddit. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Like I have no idea if, like, if I were to write that as a as a setting, uh, which which I might developing photos, interesting, Ooh. you know, yeah, horror could also develop. Um, sure. But I I, I, I have no idea whether or not <laughs> my description of it would be accurate because I imagine that the changes in like digital technology and all this sort of stuff, like there may well have been substantial changes to mm -hmm. how that works over the last you know 20 odd years um but so yeah when you're writing any job that you don't have recent experience of i think the the hope is like, you always do your research you, you you look up as many like sort of first-hand accounts as, as you can of this sort of thing uh stuff i'll, I'll be honest I, I didn't do quite as thoroughly as i should have right at the top of the uh, <laughs> archives i did for all the individual stories every time there was a story of like an in, like a statement about mm -hmm. a job uh, I, I got quite deep into the research. I really enjoyed it, but I just I the framing device job. Framing however, device. I was like, <laughs> I mean, research a framing device. What are you talking about? Uh, Who does that? I mean, the, the the hope is always that like it is close enough that it feels right to people who don't have that job, and the people who do have that job will be able to point out enough stuff that is not quite right that they feel good about their own position of knowledge, but not so much that it yanks them out of the story, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Like to be able to go, ah, now you see, this is, you know, not quite right, but not, but not so, so much that they're like, I just, that's not how it works. That's <laughs> not how it works at all. What are you doing? Be like, oh, uh, Johnny Sims, you almost got it right, but not quite, <laughs> which means I'm smarter than you, I think yeah. on something. <laughs> Honestly, the like, so much of i think i think people don't people don't necessarily sufficiently uh realize the importance of letting your audience f feel good about themselves mm. in terms of how they are interacting with with your fiction 
Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's small structural stuff like giving a piece of information that like the characters will recognize, but the but the the character so the the audience will recognize, but the characters will not. So they get a sort of like, oh, you don't know what's coming. <laughs> um, and also things like twists. Like there's, I mean, I've I've said it many times before that I think there is these days a massive overemphasis on, especially with long running shows where there are fan communities constantly doing theories oh, and yeah. it means that if you foreshadow the twist sufficiently people will have got it like not everyone but lots of people have got it and the the urge is always like oh no people have guessed the twist i need to come up with something more shocking i need to shock them i need to surprise them it's like yeah no, they're gonna feel good about the fact that they that they got it they're gonna be like yes i knew yeah. it validation so, is a huge draw for absolutely absolutely and i think that i think that often it is underestimated how important validation is in terms of, uh, you know, providing for your audience. Yeah. And especially because a lot of those twists then end up kind of coming out of nowhere. You know, it's, it's always kind yeah. of, I mean, Lost is the biggest example um, for a lot of these. Uh, Sherlock, I think also uh, did that a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's the paradox that like, if a twist, like if a twist is going to feel earned, you have to foreshadow it. Mm -hmm. But if you foreshadow a twist, then people like fandoms are so, at least any fandom will have a contingent of people who are so on the ball and so sort of structurally and genre aware oh my God, that yeah. any amount of foreshadowing is going to, like, they're going to get it. Yeah. So the, the in, in, my, in my opinion, like, it's very important to like, you foreshadow, you foreshadow some red herrings as well. And then you pay those red herrings off in a different way. Yeah. But broadly speaking, I, I yeah. Um, anyway, that's that's all to say. I'm very glad that to hear that I got the arc that I got the archives spiritually uh, right. Yeah. Even it, if I fluffed almost all the details. Yeah. I mean, if you get into like the actual like processing of an archives, it's a little. I I think when the finale came out, which it's been over a year since the finale. Um, yeah, that's what you think, but yeah, how do you feel about that after a year? Uh, good, I think. Like, I, it's the it's weird because it finishing also sort of dovetailed into um, uh, the me making the jump to uh, full time writing, yeah. Uh, so for me, it was very much like leaping off the project and immediately being like, right, okay, I've got all this other stuff mm -hmm. I need to, I need to do because. Now my livelihood is riding on her in a very real <laughs> way. Um, and also there's there's quite a, a strange, like, delayed thing because, like, there was the finishing the writing. Then yeah. Then there was the finishing the recording. And then there was the, then there was the episode actually coming out. Mm -hmm. And all of those things had about anywhere between one to three months between them. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it felt good. It felt satisfying. But it was also a weird sort of like rolling thing you know yeah you're like constantly like oh it's over oh it's over oh it's over <laughs> also like it was a bit sad because it came out right up top right at the start of well no not at the was it the start yeah no right near the start of no right at the midpoint of the pandemic oh yeah 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 uh, which meant that we couldn't have a rap party we couldn't have yeah. any sort of like we had some online stuff which was nice uh but like it didn't feel like there was a proper like physical send off send yeah they didn't feel like there was a proper physical send off uh which also added to that feeling of it not quite feeling as final as i as i'd maybe have liked mm -hmm. um but at this point with a year's remove i feel very good about the the show as a whole yeah. and uh, where I'm you start. should it was good and you should feel good about it uh despite all the archiving missteps you mean we're, <laughs> that's neither here nor there um but uh yeah because i remember because i i came into the fandom actually fairly late um i started listening i think you guys were still on this season four mid mid-season hiatus or something like that yeah that makes sense uh, <laughs> um because i had been I actually got recommended the podcast at a comic convention 
um, I was talking to an artist, uh, Marie Anger, who's on Twitter, I think, at so underscore angry. Um, and she's a great artist, uh, just really like jazzy stuff that I love. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, I'm an archivist. I don't remember how that came up in conversation. It rarely does, really. Um, but she was like, oh, have you listened to the Magnus archives? I'm like, no. <laughs> What they really nail it. They yeah, just, they really got <laughs> all she heard was archivists and she's like, oh, archives. That's the thing. Um, and I was I was very hesitant because I'm not generally speaking a horror person. It's mm. not my genre of choice. I just I mean, I think you've covered this before in other interviews. Like it a lot of people have had bad experiences with horror in terms of movies that have just been very exploitative or gory or you know like it's it's a tricky like basically the i think anyone coming up in the 90s and noughties is going to have a difficult time getting into horror uh, unless they are of a very specific demographic mm -hmm. because the two primary sort of gateways into it are stephen king who is like he's a fine writer and i like a lot of his stuff but god there is a lot of just there's a lot of cruelty and a lot of really like yeah all the stuff that people say oh no i can't get into horror it's too much x or it's too much y that's all so like laced yeah. through all of his work which means that if you are trying to get into horror and you reach for stephen king often you are going to leave that with a bad taste in your mouth and be like, ah, I guess horror's yeah. not for me. I and read Salem's stuff, Lot as a kid, or as yeah. a teenager, and it was just kind of like, mm, I'm, yeah. I'm good. <laughs> like, as a, yeah, no, I, this, this this is it. Like, I mean, it's like, as a horror writer, I'm like, that's a fine book. It's got some great scares. It does some really interesting narrative things. Mm -hmm. But there's also, like, a half dozen examples of stuff I can reach to off the top of my head that I'm like, yeah, that's going to put that's gonna put that's gonna make people think that's horror mm -mm -mm. Uh, and the other is like in the 90s and in the 90s and noughties horror was seen as a as a like a very cheap money spinner yeah. um because and like it didn't really matter what sort of schlock was put out because it was seen as something cheap that is gonna always turn a steady profit and so again like you you get a lot of really horrible exploitative stuff um and like and there are some gems in there as well but trying to wade through mm -hmm. stuff to to get to the good shit is like yeah and and so if you're not coming to it as a like if you're not coming to it as fundamentally like a, a middle class cis white guy <laughs> who has no <laughs> cause to actually be like has never actually had anything properly scary happen to them in yeah. their life it was just coasting being, through life on good yeah, vibes and being and being like oh this is this is fine i really enjoy all these <laughs> thought experiments and uh, oh yeah that would be pretty pretty horrible if it actually happened yeah <laughs> good thing it doesn't like, i've oh, never had to be a woman in the world ever so uh, how would i know that oh that seems scary from a distance yes <laughs> Like, mm. all the women yeah. out there being like well i live this every day so why would i want to relive it and like and to, like to 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 be completely uh to be completely fair like i think a lot of uh like a lot of women do also enjoy that from the other angle of like, oh yeah, yeah yeah you know engaging with stuff that is legitimately scary or traumatic is an absolutely valid uh and very real way to engage with stuff but like yeah there's a lot of shit in <laughs> and also it's so much of it is to do with who is who is the monster yeah um you know especially in uh, again like bringing in uh, stephen king as a uh, as as a as an example mm -hmm. a lot of his a lot of how he depicts monstrosity is rooted in a, like in certain racial imaginaries in sort of thing, in fat phobia in mm -hmm. ableism there's an awful lot of how he conceives of monstrosity yeah um that like if you are part of one of these demographics from which this monstrous image is being is being uh drawn you're like oh okay so i'm 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 not actually 
the protagonist here. I'm the okay. Well, I'm 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 out. Yeah, uh, Princess Weeks on YouTube did a really good video about the magical Negroes of, Se- of Stephen mm. King, which oh, I he highly he recommend. Loves he loves them. He really does. Uh, yeah, but I recommend that video for anyone who would like to. Uh, you should all just actually just look at more Princess Weeks stuff. She's very good. Also, writer at the Mary Sue. So, um, but yeah, like there was a lot of a lot in the Magnus Arcus that is me. I like trying to avoid that as much as possible mm-hmm. um and I like I mean I'm 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 not immune to to thoughtless writing occasionally I don't know that there's uh plenty of, of spots in it that I've that I've messed up but like the 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 aim of it is to be horror that isn't that is accessible to 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 pretty much anyone yeah um, and I I feel like um and yeah, there's always going to be missteps no matter what you do. I mean, you're writing essentially from a, a, a place that you know. You try to do the research you can. And yeah, it, I, I don't think anyone ever gets it 100% right. It would be impossible. Um, much like with archiving. Um, you, do, you do your best. You yeah. try to learn from your mistakes and uh, you don't fall into spirals about it. Yeah. And, and I mean... One of the things I know that people compliment you on that you don't, um, I know you don't want to take any credit for was, I mean, the asexual uh, orientation of the archivist. And uh, I absolutely understand. It's just kind of like you're doing the bare minimum. You, It's it's something that it's, kind it's of... It's bare minimum. And it's something that like it... I mean, I think, like, I mean, I'm happy to to take credit from it in as much as this was something that felt like it emerged very naturally from the character across mm. the course of the first few seasons and i and I, I i i feel comfortable taking credit for when that happened me and alex recognizing it and being mm. like oh yeah this is this is a thing yeah. um which i think often when characters do something unexpected like that there is there isn't like there wasn't in this case but there is often an urge to like almost shy away from it and be like oh do we yeah. do we lean into this? Do we leave it as as accidental subtext, etc.? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm I I feel like I feel like it is I, I'm I'm comfortable being like yeah that was that was pretty that was pretty good of us like yeah. you know as a, as an back, ace I guess yeah as an ace archivist I appreciate the representation <laughs> uh, you know and also I mean one of the things that I know this has nothing to do with archives but it's um, it's one of those things like you have an asexual character and often there's nothing beyond that where it's just like, oh, they're ace, so they don't, and that's it. We won't talk about any kind of relationships that they could potentially have. But then when you're writing this horror workplace comedy that you've developed, uh, and, you know, I, I probably should have said this up top, but spoilers for the Magnus archives. Oh, um, yeah, uh, big spoilers. Yeah, big spoilers, big spoilers. but like with John and Martin getting together mm. and the whole, I mean, the entirety of season four being one big, like, get them together romantic subplot, essentially. Um, I, it, I think it felt, I, I guess I want to say validating because it's like, there's a lot of people who assume that because you're asexual that you just don't want any relationships whatsoever. Yeah, I um, mean, like, fundamentally, I've, I've, got, I've got a handful of sort of very wonderful ace people in my life. Uh, mm-hmm. And like, I would say the majority of them are either in or have been at various points um, in very loving relationships. Um, mm-hmm. I like, so it it, it didn't. I that I I, I feel I, I had an advantage in that a lot of that I was referencing from. Like, I mean, I I know I know I know ace people like that. That's yeah. I don't I don't need to rely on like me having a reckon of what. Uh, pro- they probably don't, you know. <laughs> They're just like everybody else, it turns out. Um, yeah, who knew? Who knew? Uh, <laughs> it's almost like we're human beings or some shit. Um, but getting back to the archives part of it, uh, the, despite the all the... I mean, I could quite frankly talk to you about a lot of things in the Magnus archives. and There's I'm 200 episodes. So I know. A lot there. there. Well, it's not even just that. It's just because um, sometimes, like, like I said before, I, I came in late season four. I binged a lot of it. So certain things got stuck in my head. Other things did not. Like there are details from episodes, I'm sure even over the course of 200, you don't even remember. Oh but, God. A, a yeah. People be like, oh, what about this thing? I'm like, 
I did I write that episode? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like an episode I'd write. But no, I think Alex wrote that episode. Um, Alex didn't write any of the episodes. Oh, of course not. No. It was all me. Oh, all he you. edited some of them pretty heavily, but... So oh, that's, yeah. That's He's really like, uh, Johnny, mm-mm. no, 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 no. Um, and you're like, yes, 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 yes. Uh, I assume that's how the writing process works. Uh, broadly, like, I, I'll, I'll be honest, like, I... I've never been desperately precious about my writing. Yeah. Um, so, broadly speaking, whenever Alex has been like, Oh, I think this needs to go. I'm like, yeah, okay. Uh, occasionally, <laughs> I've never occasionally seen Johnny like, so no, angry. You don't understand. You don't understand. <laughs> this is core. Um, but but usually, like, uh, I I I think I'm I, I I'm a I believe I'm quite good to edit for, mm-hmm. uh, but dreadful to proofread for. Uh, <laughs> um. Yeah. So that being that being said, uh, so came in season four. Like details are a little like hazy at at times but i do remember because i started listening to magnus when i was on a flight back from an archives conference um i just had it kind of queued up i was like all right maybe i'll listen to it because i know it says it's an archives and i'm an archivist and maybe um and so i think i listened to like the first four episodes um on my my flight home and i just remember being pulled into it because again, going into this idea of the spiritual uh, aspects of the archives, you know, to you know, lack of a, of a better word, um, there's just so much in just even the first episode that spoke to me as an archivist. Um, because you have you have John, you have the archivist, uh, basically starting a job from which his predecessor, though she has mysteriously disappeared, um, just like she's taken all the institutional knowledge with her. Like, he doesn't know why anything is the way it is. Like, he's had no experience, no training. He's just given this position by Elias and is told, like, let's just do something with it. Um, and he's essentially, the first episode is him complaining into a tape <laughs> and just being like, there's a lot of stuff here and I guess I'll digitize it. Yeah, like, there's a, there's a like, I think... There are certain universals uh, that one can always lean on um, in terms of uh, professions. If you don't know anything about a profession, uh, there are certain things that are always that are that are always true. Which is, whoever was in your position before you was probably an idiot and left the place in a mess. <laughs> and technology is always get, uh, uh, can i swear by the way oh yeah yeah go ahead yeah technology's fuck always yeah. gonna fuck up yeah <laughs> um and so like the first two episodes are very much like leaning quite heavily on those two things mm-hmm. uh in a way that i'm like I, I don't know much about archiving but i know workplaces yeah and <laughs> this is gonna ground it yeah no it it really is because like uh what i saw also is a commonality between a lot of these other um audio fiction um projects is digitization is always kind of like the the goal, the nebulous goal of the archivist to begin with, um, which speaks to a lot of people being like, well, why don't you just digitize everything? It's fine, right? Like, mm. if you put it on the cloud, everything's good, right? Like, no, not really. Uh, the cloud is forever, Sam. The cloud is forever. Johnny, I hate to tell you, um, nothing is forever. Uh, <laughs> except for the constant of fear. Um, which we covered in, in the previous, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, I, lo- I love this idea that the archivist is, you know, it's like, I'm going to digitize, turns out some of these things won't effing record. Uh, so we'll use this analog technology, which also kind of gets into this, this other stereotype of like archives and analog tech, um, which I don't, I don't believe you were purposely drawing upon in any way because analog tech and archives is interesting because archives are always traditionally about 10 years behind in terms of our tech and like how we can help uh, preserve born digital documents and, and everything. But it's like a happy accident when you hear that. You're like, I mean, it's not, I, I wouldn't say it's 100% an accident in, in the sense that like, I didn't know it about it a huge amount specifically from an archival point of view, but I like I've done enough. Uh, I've I've interacted with academic institutions mm. enough 
that I don't think this is a solely a, an, archi- an, an archival thing. I think that like academia generally tends Fair. to be like it tends to it, it it's very it's rarely cutting edge in terms of its technology. Yeah. Um, it because it, it because any academic institution with a long enough history has so much inertia to it mm-hmm. that uh, the idea of it keeping up with modern technology is very difficult because so much of like even like not necessarily just archives but so much in- in- information in any sort of academic context oh, for sure. is going to be tied into what it like it, it it's 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 old form and like the yeah like the, the idea of digitization projects is uh I, I i imagine very much very prevalent in in like archival circles but it's also something that that is exists in in any sort of record keeping um and like i i, I worked for a while um at a, at a place that had like literally rooms of old-fashioned uh manila folders in like oh yeah yeah huge things and there was so much talk of like digitization and this this was this was in the mid 2000s like this was oh my god after, yeah like, this was long after like digitized and it wasn't even a big a big organization mm-hmm. um but so but it was so clear that like so much of this stuff like it, again it's this weight of inertia mm-hmm. um so like a, again it, it wasn't it wasn't deliberate in that it wasn't intended to be in conversation with like professional discourse within archiving for sure yeah, um, yeah. but it but i i, I similar to have reaching for like oh my predecessor left this place in a mess i felt pretty comf- confident i felt pretty comfortable within a, an academic adjacent space reaching for technology is running behind mm-hmm. uh running behind things and like th- there's a lot of there's a strange mix of old and new media at work yeah and i and i think the tapes also lend that um that grounding physicality, I think. And uh, it's similar to um, the SCP Archives podcast where it all sounds like a tape deck or a reel-to-reel and you're just, you just kind of hear that, that punch that... Uh, and to, a, a lot of this is also drawing out of... Like, I, one of the things I enjoy most about writing uh, is taking, taking practical or... Uh, narrative ne- or practical or production necessities and figuring out how to make them coherent within the world mm-hmm. of the narrative uh, and so like the tape concept um, was one of many that we were throwing around at the very early stages of development and Alex locked into it very hard mm. because adding a little bit of tape hiss helps tide a myriad of sins mm. in terms of uh, when you are just starting an, uh, an audio podcast uh, and your resources are, shall we say, not what they would be uh, in the later seasons. Oh, a um, bit. And so, and he was, he was, and so he was like, oh, this is, that's actually a really, a really good way to keep the audio quality quite consistent. We can like do a lot of stuff with levels and add that tape piss mm-hmm. allows us to, essentially keep the start the start the start the podcast at the same quality we end it at yeah Um, for sure it's also i mean just as a good narrative device to kind of utilize the tapes is like oh this is when something important or interesting is happening Mm -hmm. so it's like it's kind of like weeding out the fluff that would have been happening between (laughs) so immediately when you've got okay so these statements are going to be recorded onto tape and all the statements that people hear are going to be the ones that are real because yeah. otherwise because that like from a from a narrative point of view that is that is essential we can't have we can't have stories that turn out to be fake uh within the podcast except for that so, one that one episode where it was <laughs> um so then there's the question so then then you go with okay so something special about the tapes why are these ones and so from there you can sort you like i I sort of play with the the rubik's cube of these elements Mm -hmm. until it locks into place with the the ones that are real because they have the attention of these entities don't record properly to computers which then leads into okay so that means i can also do a lot of weird stuff with computers because these these powers 
interact with that sort of electronic technology in strange ways. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a, it was a similar thing in, in season three with the, like, once I realized how little I actually knew about the process of archiving, <laughs> it's, 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 again, it's, it's the taking the, it's the taking the thing that is, that has to be true about the, 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 the production um, or is accidentally true about it because somebody didn't do enough research up top mm. uh, and finding a way to fold it into the fiction yeah which is yeah uh, which is in in the, that season three conversation where yeah the satirist georgie is like you don't know anything about archiving mm. and uh, the archivist is like <laughs> i could <laughs> um, I, I just love that she points out you have a uh, it's she points out that john has an english degree um yeah. Which I actually do know archivists who had English degrees before they came into oh, archives. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Yeah. But English degrees that fed into, I would imagine, like multiple years of extensive additional training. Perhaps, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I don't know everybody in the archives community. <laughs> we don't know, all know each other, Johnny. Um, just saying. Because I have a history, I'm like, I have a hit, master's in history, and that's how yeah. I got into archives. And But some people have actually gone through like, masters of library sciences or yeah, yeah. information sciences degrees like georgie points out in in that episode like it's it's it's, a, it's an academic discipline it is yeah it is a, a it is a, a like it, it is a, a an expansive set of very real skills and <laughs> like a, a, a proper knowledge base that yeah you, you don't just i mean like i mean maybe there are places out there that are just like oh you you could be the archivist now good luck but uh <laughs> Broadly speaking, yeah. that's not something that happens. If you're one of those people, please let me know. Um, <laughs> and also tell Johnny about it, I guess. So you can be like, well, hello there, Mr. Sims. <laughs> um, and one of the things that actually uh, was important to me in terms of the the show overall, because you had the episode Binary, which I remember very clearly because it goes into the kind of like the difference between analog and digital. You know, you have, uh, I believe her name is Tessa Winters is the yes, character. I think so. Yeah. yeah, she's just going off about, you know, like the differences and how they're not as different as we think they are, that what was analog was considered the technological advancement of the time. Um, but then it also plays into this overall theme that I loved because when you get into season five, which is my favorite season, just because it goes so off the wall and I love it. Um, it, I, quite frankly, like I, 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 obviously I love seasons one through four. I, you love your, your children as much as you can, but season five is like your special I, little guy. <laughs> I mean, fundamentally, like it, it's, it's very much, I mean, you, you talk about binaries. I think Magnus Archives, uh, fans can broadly be separated into those who, for whom season five is like a favorite and those for whom season five is the least favorite, which is like. Possible. Something that we something that we kind of knew going in because it was like this is a big swing, a big sea change, and like some people are gonna really vibe with it, and some people are really not gonna. Yeah, no, and and I I understand that, but I, as from as someone who writes, like from a writing point of view, I was just like, oh, Johnny's stretching here. Look at this. Look at this man flex. Like, <laughs> I mean, that, like a, a lot of it was just like. After four seasons, I was like, I feel like, I like after two seasons, I was like, I feel like I've done most of what I can do within the very confined, mm -hmm. uh, within the statement itself. And then over seasons three and four, I was like, I feel like I've done, like I've, I've stretched to my current limits within the, like the audio drama mm -hmm. uh, dialogue sort of space. And so season five, I was like, I'm going to get rid of all of those limits and yes. see what I can do. Yeah, I, it's... It was just a joy, like for especially the um, the carousel episode with the that stranger. Was a lot of fun to write. That it's so like it just it hits you in different points when the the way the statements are presented, like the coroner's report with the death roots, and um, I loved the one with Jared Hopworth, the the mm. kind of the notes on the plants. Um, the it, it all just kind of hits in different ways because it's like it's still a statement but it's just done in such a different way where you're like, ooh, that's, that's interesting. Like also the different types of um, records that it kind of mirrors, you know? Yeah, like that, that was very much, uh, uh, again, that like that's in season five, you get to really sort of take the shackles off and really experiment. Cause I, I, I love, I love different forms. I love different media. 
um well i mean or, or rather what i should say is i love different mediums mm-hmm. um and like so much of so much of magnus comes out of really wanting to get into and explore the the sort of the single voice storytelling mm-hmm. audio uh idea of, of, of audio um and yeah in season five a lot of it is just me being like Oh, I wonder if I could write a coroner. Uh, I could write a, a horror story as a coroner's report. Yeah. I wonder if I could write a horror story as this or that or you know. Yeah. No, it's uh, uh, like the coroner's report one. I think really stuck with me just because it is a type of record. So it's like you're taking that me- the, again the medium and you're utilizing it in a way that is a spiritual kind of like uh, remnants of the archives themselves. Yeah. Um, which I appreciate. Um, and uh, to get to, to get back to the point before I gushed again, um, the the idea of binaries, which I loved because of when you get into season five, the fact of the matter is that when originally John describes the um, to Jerry Key, he the, it's described the fears are like colors, but if colors hated me, uh, so this kind of like this wash of, uh, of a color wheel. And then you get to season five where the binary sticks, where it's watched and watcher, um, which I really, I appreciated because you had that academic episode, the, uh, the monument, you know, just kind of really sticking it to academia <laughs> at the same time, which I appreciated. <laughs> like, look at them trying to organize and categorize that which they cannot know. Yeah, like, I mean, I think, I think so much, uh, like a lot of season five, like the, the there is, I mean, obviously there are lots of themes throughout the Magnus archives, uh, right. but the, I think that the idea of binaries is something that has, that like really did, um, like was running through, my mind was running through a, a lot of it and like how artificial they almost always are. Yeah. Uh, like the, the fact that actually there aren't, as like, there are basically no actual full binaries in mm-hmm. like in, in nature or in society as, as we as we understand it and like a lot of season five is like well what if there actually was a binary and, yeah like, and the idea that like binaries can only ever be artificially imposed mm-hmm. and kind of the inherent horror of that yeah like the inherent horror of like okay well there's two things uh, and some people are this side some people are that side what about the people who want to be well no. mm-hmm. i mean that's that's too bad like Sorry, this, can't is, help you. this is a, a world where a binary has been actively imposed and it is horrifying yeah it uh i love that that was kind of like the ultimate evil ends up being a static categorization that no one can remove themselves from <laughs> it's like oh that hits hard <laughs> yeah yeah and it's and it's it's like i mean that like binary the episode itself is sort of very much about like my issues with how I think a lot of transhumanism is is conceived mm-hmm. uh, and the the idea of like oh you can just you can, you can uh, like the idea of AI or digitizing consciousness or this sort of thing where mm-hmm. it's like the brain is not a computer like <laughs> a computer is a very handy like metaphor for the brain mm-hmm. but the brain is a big squishy bit of electrified meat that <laughs> is just just wobbling all over the shop at all times it's and true. it doesn't operate remotely like a computer and like the horror the idea of like having your thoughts actually confined to uh to, to yeah like a to a binary system of uh, of computer logic of of computer processing like that's something that feels deeply horrifying to me thank you for bringing that existential dread i okay um <laughs> well we're we're running uh uh at a time here so i want to uh because we want to uh promote pit crawler um oh, yes. but uh before we do that i'm gonna run you through a couple of archival sins that you did just so that people know that i did my due diligence all right so <clears throat> one of them uh the archival assistance uh breaking and entering into <laughs> various <laughs> Is, is that not standard archiving procedure? Mm-mm-mm. First of all, you have far too many assistants. Uh, the The fact of the matter that John was not by himself most of the time is so unrealistic. I don't understand. <laughs> um, yeah, 
academic funding it's, it's, it's uneven it's you know, yeah you have a different institute fine whatever i'll give it to you um but the fact that their their standard follow-up seems to be breaking and entering and or hacking into police databases uh jonathan uh <laughs> again i'm pretty confident this is all still i, I mean i like i don't wanna, i don't want to accuse uh the archive any archives that you work for as being square but <laughs> uh you know all right fair enough fair enough we'll try to be cooler in the in the future um the other thing yeah, uh, sorry, Sam, i was writing badass archives so I don't oh know if, uh, oh you know. oh okay well here we go noted jonathan <laughs> Uh, the second thing, uh, I think it was in, oh, what was it? I lost my train of thought for a second because you accused me of being uncool. Oh, no. no. Uh, staples you had in, uh, the fifth season. Yeah. And I know this goes into the idea that John the Archivist does not know what he's doing, but having his assistant's staple statements together... <laughs> is I think I got more questions on that because I did a Rusty Quill, um, uh, basically a TED talk mm. for the RQ Discord, RIP, uh, in which people were like, how do you feel about the staples, Sam? <laughs> I'm pretty confident. Uh, if that was season five, I'm pretty confident that by then I had done enough research that I knew that was like, I, I think that might have been me needling. I mean, maybe you specifically. <laughs> But like, I think yeah, that, that specifically, me needling the people, like needling people, like this isn't how archives work. And I'm like, oh, that's I know. Staple some statements. Those are going to get so rusty after a while. You watch. Holy shit! Look at how rusty these staples are. Um, but yeah, it's fair enough. Rolling all over it in biro. Oh god! They brought pencils and coffee, and they're just pouring it on top of everything. They're not even in acid-free folders. I'm telling you. <laughs> So yes, that that was a big one um, that people asked me about specifically because they're like, "How do you feel?" Like I understand and appreciate his choices, um, but also do not care for this idea at all. Um, also, to remove all staples is a foolish uh, thing, and you should, probably shouldn't even try to attempt it. Um, uh, but when you're adding staples, different, uh, <laughs> you're adding to the problem. Uh, the other one I think that was a big one for me was um, the digitization, but then finding out they didn't actually have a database to store any of the digital files. Oh, uh, yeah, I didn't think about the database stuff at all. Uh, the database aspect of it. It's like, it's like Millhouse and, the, and the, the goldfish, like, why did I have the bowl, Bart? Why did I have the bowl? <laughs> why, Johnny? Why did yep. you have the digitization? I don't know. Well, the, the, I mean, the honest answer is because, like, the same reason that, like, basically every video game between 2005 and 2015 had audio logs. I because, see. like, and it's the same, like, digitization is a very easy, it's a very easy reach in terms of uh, this sort of, this sort of audio stuff to explain why a lot of old stuff is being brought up and being engaged with yeah. uh in in any sort of way like it's 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 a handy conceit um but not one that i gave enough consideration i i like i i yeah I, I didn't actually look up what digitization necessarily meant it felt like the what? right word oh my god i felt like it felt like the right word it's like digitization that's that's yeah that's when you take an old thing mm -hmm. and you look at it yep and then it's a new thing. Sure. That's digital. For her, um, there it is. Boom. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's, that's, I mean, broad strokes. Totally got it. Yeah. 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 Completely. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> nobody told me that there should be a database in this. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's good. It's all good. Um, uh, yeah. Those are like the big ones. I do remember someone asking me how they would preserve the bone apple teeth uh, uh, one time they were just asking me personally like how would you what would you do with that apple and i was like well first of all it's horrific and we wouldn't keep it second of all take a picture because unless that thing's being like preserved by dark magics and the collective will of all those involved that thing's gonna rot quickly yeah uh i i i, I don't know like i have in my mind i have this image of like dipping it in i forget what that like see-through 
uh, like a sealant kind of thing, yeah, yeah. Like just just a big, like basically a big ice cube with it in the middle, <laughs> but, but like made of plastic. Was it one of those food processors where you can just kind of like pull all the air out and it just? You no, know how you used to get those joke ice cubes with a fly in it. Oh um, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like that, but with the with the with the apple inside. Gotcha. Either that, or I'm thinking of just sous viding it and just like, <laughs> um, but yeah. Okay, so we only have a few more minutes to have a heart out. Uh, Pit Crawler, tell me about Pit Crawler. Yes. Uh, Pit Crawler is an RPG that is currently on Indiegogo. Uh, it is uh, two players inspired by old school adventure game books. Myself and my partner Sasha, uh, we put out tabletop RPGs as a MacGuffin and Company, uh, and it's our latest game. It massively kicks ass. Yes. Uh, and if you like my work, um, please do go check it out. It is at uh, igg.me slash at slash pitcrawler. All and I'll put all the links in, um, as well as links to yourself and Sasha's uh, company, to MacGuffin. And yeah, because as someone who, uh, if no one knows, I'm also Lotus Flare in the community for Johnny Streams. <laughs> uh, as someone who has made quite a bit of title card art, <laughs> When you guys have played games, a lot, a lot, very, it's it's wonderful. We look forward to it every time. <laughs> I'm sure, like I always feel, but I always feel like I'm just like spamming. But at the same time, it's like it's no, it's great. It's great. It speaks to how much I actually thoroughly enjoy Pit Crawler that I can make a title card and just be like, it probably fits. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, I I backed it. It back Pit Crawler. Everybody do it. Uh, it's important for the rest of your life to do so um and support mcguffin and company and support johnny and sasha because they're really good people and i like them uh and uh yeah uh, also johnny's book 13 stories is out you should also read that i'm currently staring at it at my bookshelf i read it it's very good um yeah I, well thank you so much for having me on it's been an absolute delight very much so johnny i appreciate you taking the time and coming on and uh hope to talk to you in the future someday you so. too. all right okay. thanks